Got it. Welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Anton Raimundo on the Flame of Love show on Radio Maria. Thank you for joining me for part two, Gara Bandal with author Ted Flynn, by, back by popular demand. And we want to be able to hit some of the details from the book, which we didn't cover um, from the first video uh, two weeks ago. So we're going to get into some of those stories and some of the details from his book, um, Garabandal. And before we get into all of that, let us start off this program like we normally do with our traditional three prayers for the flame of love. So first, let us start off by honoring our Heavenly Father through all the wounds of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We kiss the wound of his sacred left hand with sorrow deep and true. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We kiss the wound of your sacred right hand with sorrow deep and true. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We kiss the wound of your sacred left foot with sorrow deep and true. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We kiss the wound of your sacred right foot with sorrow deep and true. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We kiss the wound of your sacred side with sorrow deep and true. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray the Hail Mary with the petition of the flame of love. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners. Spread the effective grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And let us pray the unity prayer. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal Father. Amen. Again, welcome back, Ted. How are you doing? Thank you very much. Very well, thanks. Yes, you know, you're all over the internet, especially with, with this book that you, that just came out. And, you know, um, I wanted to highlight that um, reference that you put in your book, uh, Garbandal that you reference Elizabeth Kindleman and you chose a very apt quote and I wanted, it deserves to be highlighted again. <clears throat> and this is from um, the quote where, where she says um, that our, our lady um, was, was uh, talking to um, Elizabeth Kindleman. And remember for those listeners who are tuning for the first time um, that if you heard of us from our last program, Elizabeth Kindleman, you know, she's the locutionist behind the flame of love. And she was a third order Carmelite um, from Budapest, uh, Budapest, Hungary. And uh, Cardinal Peter Urdu gave his imprimatur back in the year 2009, in, in June 6th. And uh, so in the diary, it says, the renewal of the earth will take place through the power and imploring force of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her message also said, due to the lack of faith, earth is entering into darkness, but earth will experience a great jolt of faith. Our Lady told Elizabeth Kindleman, in that dark night, heaven and earth will be illuminated by the flame of love that I offer to souls. It is so great that I cannot keep it any longer within me. It leaps out to you with explosive power. When it pours out, my love will destroy the satanic hatred that contaminates the world. The greatest number of souls will be set free. Nothing like this has existed before. This is my greatest miracle that I will do for all. And so this dives in to you know, the warning the great miracle, the permanent sign, you know? Um, and so that's why I also wanted you in here, Ted, because 
I, I see in it just because, you know, I love the, the flame of love of, of the Immaculate Heart of Mary movement, and I can't help but see how they're both, you know, um, converging. When we talked about last uh, two weeks ago, when we had you on the program, we talked about how these locutions and the visions that have happened happened right in 1961 through 65, right when the flame of love also started. Um, right. Yes. And so um, I, I wanted to show uh, and share my screen here um, with everybody so they could see where if they're interested in finding out more about um, Ted Flynn and his wonderful apostle with his wife, Maureen, the, you know, they started a magazine called uh, Sign Sign of Our Times 34 years ago or back in 1988. And here's their website, sign.org, where you can um, order their different magazines here or get, get all this uh, information. And here are the different magazines you can order. And of course, you can order his book, uh, Garabandal, from the website there. Um, and also regarding uh, Flame of Love, they wrote a great article last year on February 2023 there. All you got to do is search for the Flame of Love and it'll go on their web website. But I highly recommend sign.org. Um, that there's a treasure trove of information and resources and books and so forth that you can get there. And of course, their magazine, Signs and, and Wonders. And so um, I, I highly recommend that. Anyway, Ted, so um, let's... Uh, you know, we we when we talked last time, we got into the very um, points about the great miracle, and you know how that would be on a particular Thursday, eight thirty, um, on you know uh, Spain time, but we skipped over about like you know when the uh, girls, the the visionaries, had these nights of screams. And I didn't they have like two different kinds. And and I want the, the audience to know why is that important from these young girls? Why is that important that it, we should know about this? Well, there were two nights, but I'd like to do this. In the book, I intentionally didn't try to validate Garabandal with many other people. But the reason I put Elizabeth Kindleman, who we've done articles on it, as you know, and, and feature articles in the magazine, but if, what Elizabeth Kindleman said, if we could just take a minute to literally unpack that, it's so profound in how accurate I think it is. And as I said, I didn't include what many other people said because I wanted Garabandal to stand on its own. But listen to, listen to the emotive language here. It'll be the renewal of the earth. Think of that, the renewal of the earth. It'll take place through the power and imploring force of the Blessed Mother as the prophetess of our age, as the chosen instrument of heaven in these times, the same way Moses was the deliverer of people. She, as the new Ark of the Covenant, is playing a critical and pivotal role in our times to bring us to a new era, a new Jerusalem, a second Pentecost, new times, an era of peace. These Amen. all mean something a little different, but they all mean absolutely profound change. So listen, her, uh, due to the lack of faith, yes, we see that all around. Just going kind of line by line here a little bit. The world, the earth is entering into darkness, but earth will experience a great jolt of faith. Now, whether or not that's the warning and or the miracle, the answer is probably both. It, it'll have to be both because, as I always say, they're like three. They're like three acts in the same play. Yes, and then also just that key word darkness, because then that goes into like the three days of darkness, right? Well, you, it, it, I I think it's more a metaphor, a metaphorical thing right here that the world is dark spiritually. It, it it could be, but also just as an aside, if we think about Saint Paul's conversion, because you know his the conversion of Saint Paul, his feast day, you know, was just a few days ago on the twenty fifth. And um, and so, you know, he had his his three days of darkness, per se, right when he was blinded. Right. That's and so, right. And then he found and he had the jolt as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so what, to me, I this is like say, the enlightenment, you know, how people are going to get the illumination of conscience. Well, I always say to people who are maybe 
you know, uh, maybe anti-private revelation, visionary, locutionist, or whatever. I said, can you name the first visionary in the New Testament? Mm. The answer is St. Paul being knocked off his horse for, and being blinded. And I always love he goes to a street called Straight. Straight oh, Street. Right. Straight Street. You know, you got to love it right out of a movie. But in that dark night, heaven and earth will be illuminated. Heaven and earth. Now, the, the word warning has some interchangeable words, whether it's the judgment in miniature, uh, the illumination of conscience, or the warning, or, you know, um, some people equate this with a near-death experience. And I think it's much more profound than a near-death experience, but either way, they're both significant events. So it's going to be illuminated by a flame of love, which I offer to souls. It's an offering. You can turn it down. If somebody gives you something, you can say yes or no. She used the word offer, which is, I find. Yes. It. Great point. And, and, and what's the reason for it? It's love. The warning and the miracle are about love, which is mercy and trust. That's what it is. I mean, it's the ultimate act of divine mercy is what it is. It is so great that I, that I cannot keep it any longer within me. It leaps out to you with explosive power. That's what this event is. Look at these words she's using. Explosive. When it pours out, my love will destroy the satanic hatred that contaminates the world. Every one of these phrases and sentences means something. Satan's power is going to be minimized that he knows that we know. We know that he knows, you know, that his power, uh, uh, which is now contaminating the whole world, will, will take on a new dimension. The greatest number of souls will be set free. Think of it. The greatest number of souls, it's a day that is going to affect every single person in the world at the same time. And there's never been an event like this in history where every single person in the world will, will have some sort of event at the exact same time. Nobody can ever point to that. Right. We talked about the miracle last time where there's, I think I gave like 18 or 19 data points according to what the girl said, not anybody else. But what they said from 1961 to 1965, where the Blessed Mother appeared over 2,000 times over four years and four months. And so we know there's, there's quite a few messages. But nothing like this has existed before. This is absolutely a brand new event in the world. It's never happened before. It'll be seen and the warning will be seen and felt. And we can get into that maybe a little bit later of what's me, what it means to see something all over the world. But we know the felt part is the interior burning of what we see in our own life, in our own heart, in our own soul at, right. this, at this warning. If, if I may interject here about how uh, it said the greatest number of souls will be set free. Nothing like this existed before. But just if we recall back, remember the Twin Towers in 9-11. Do you remember after that hit, so many people went back to church for just a few weeks? Remember that? Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and so even though we can cite that, that that was a big worldwide event, right? And at the same time, this says nothing will exist like this before. And 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 back then, souls, you know, came to church for I don't know how many weeks, was it two or three? And then they stopped. They stop going. They stop going again. It's the same sort of thing. I mean, when, yes. the Jews, when the Jews left Egypt, within six weeks, they were making a golden calf. So, you know, their memories were pretty short after literally seeing two million people, including the Hebrews and the rabble, all going through, you know, protected under this cloud of, of water where they all got to the other, other side. Nothing like this has existed before. The Blessed Mother literally said that this will not be explained by science and it has never happened before. And I have a quote that um, uh, it wasn't from Garabandal, but from somewhere else that the human mind is not going to be able to comprehend this. So I can tell you when you see this data all in one place of event, event, what was said, what was said, the events coming it's overwhelming when you really sit down in quiet moment, whether you're in Eucharistic adoration or something in complete quiet 
and to try to digest this, it's it's overwhelming. Then listen to this. This is my my greatest miracle that I will do for all. I, I mean, think those, that's pretty audacious to me because considering Fatima, 70,000 people, you know, all over the area there could see it, even atheists and agnostics, right? I just read just from the book, just 10 lines of what you had read about Elizabeth Kindleman, where there was a little bit more that she received the imprimatur from Cardinal Perder, uh, Peter Erdo, what in 2009. But th this, this is in essence saying a lot of the exact same material, which is why I think Elizabeth Kindleman is major, has really caught this major. Yes. But that was a, a very long distraction from your first question of the night of screams but it well, was it's, it was very important still because that ties in directly here if people have ears to hear and 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 eyes to see they will they can make these connections so let's get into it the first night of screams so this is right here about a year after we know the first apparition of the blessed mother was july 2 the archangel michael came july 1 and then um the uh July 2 is when the Blessed Mother appeared first in 1961. And so literally, you know, um, 11 months later, on June 19th, 1962, the Blessed Mother came at 1030 p.m. for about 50 minutes of what is called the Nights of Screams. There were two nights. People think there were one. But there was actually two. And here's what was said. Jacinta and Mary Lowly saw visions. Now, now again, you want, I'll go slow here because this is so profound. They saw visions where Russia would have dominion over the world and communism would rule Europe. So I'll just read this and we can go back and maybe put a little bit of meat on the bone there. Priests would go into hiding. Churches would be destroyed and there would be many martyrs. Wow. The girls were shown in a vision that rivers would turn red with blood. The church would be persecuted and decimated. It doesn't say suppressed or anything here. The word, although that was used at another point where the mass would be suppressed. But this is the church would be decimated. Now, we're not there in many parts of the world. The, the Christianity has experienced this, especially in many war, war spots, of the, uh, spots of the world where there's war and, and the Catholic Church is being persecuted in many countries. But we're not seeing this specifically yet in the West. Believers have been marginalized, but not necessarily persecuted to the degree they are in other places. The girls were shown in a vision that rivers would turn red and the church would be persecuted and decimated. Its buildings would no longer exist as they once did. Professing your faith would be very difficult and the sacraments would be difficult to receive. Now, the, that means there's a major change coming to the world before these events. Now, I decided to do the book um, as a result of, you know, you could see what was happening with the Pope wanting to go to Moscow. Francis has had a specific agenda, which I think we got into two weeks ago, and he's wanted to go specifically to Moscow. And then the other is that they would, uh, the warning would happen after a synod. Now we know we're in the third year of the synod right now because it's going the local, the continental, or the, you know, the diocesan, which maybe many people even listening participated in in their own church. Then we saw last October in Rome where there were many churches in Pope Paul VI Hall with tables of 10 where they discuss where to bring the church. And the next phase is called the universal phase. And so, you know, and, you know, it doesn't say that, you know, the warning will happen the day after the synod ends, which I have right. concern that people could fall away, that it doesn't happen exactly when they think it should, because that would be very much tied into human nature. The girls were heard crying out, stop telling us these things. Wait, wait. Everyone should confess they should get ready. When it, when it appears all is lost, the warning would come. Barry Hanratty, who wrote the, uh, the Garabandal Journal in the Garabandal Magazine for 50 years of his life, he passed away recently. He said their tear-stained faces are incoherent 
speech immediately afterwards attested to the trauma experienced by Jacinta, Mary Lowley, and Mary Cruz during the first night of screams. And it doesn't appear that they gave many details of what they experienced for quite some time. In other words, the girls the next day or even shortly after it didn't, didn't immediately just release a message. This was some of it, but there was more that came out and they didn't, but they didn't release a, a, a whole part of what it was. But these components that we've been discussing are a part of that, like, like the, the world would experience an invasion of communism that was specifically used. Now, I've said in the United States that we may not have communism at the point of a gun, but if you look at what's happened through legislation really since when the Supreme Court of the United States in 1962 and 63 took prayer out of the classroom and the Bible out of the classroom, that is communism, you know, yeah. in, in public schools. So, so these sort of things are very, very big. The Virgin told us that we do not expect the chastisement, that with, without expecting it, it will come since the world has not changed. And she has already told us twice that we do not, if we do not pay attention to her, since the world is getting worse, and it should change very much. It has not changed at all. Prepare yourselves, confess because the chastisement will come soon and the world continues the same. So there's a little bit of repetition in there, you know, the way a 12 year old, a 13 year old would talk. So, so we know that this is a major event, I guess maybe just to hit the highlights, Russia would have dominion over the world. Now we've just seen NATO where they've just amassed 90,000 troops and we know Article 5 is what's called collective defense inside the NATO document, that if any one of the 30 nations inside NATO are, are attacked, the rest, by definition, need to come and support that. So, I mean, if you want to take a look at either the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, or even Poland, which is so close, you know, northern Poland is up by the Baltic, on the Baltic, and up towards Gdansk. And so um, we know that Russia has a major, major part to play in this. And so here's NATO amassing 90,000 troops. And they've never done that before. You know, it, that document, it, you know, it really evolved. NATO began to evolve in, from 1949 on as a result of what happened with World War II to, to contain Russia even though Russia had, you know, Russia and the United States armies basically converged on Berlin pretty much the same, the same time in 1945 anyway. So that was the first night of screams. So that's really big stuff. Priests would go into hiding, churches would be destroyed, and there will be many martyrs. Something happens to cause a, some sort of systemic collapse for, the, for these events. Now, the second night of screams was the next night. It was on June 20th, 1962, on the vigil of Corpus Christi. There was another horrifying vision that lasted for three and a half hours. And just before I forget, the whole town went to confession after these. Oh, these really? Screams. Yeah. Incredible. The girls saw destructive things happening in the world at a future time. Mary Lowley Masson said, we saw rivers change into blood. Now listen to this, fire fell from the sky. That's the message of Akito, fire from heaven. Oh, true, right. Which is an approved apparition in the church. And we know that Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was ahead of his CDF, said the message of Akita Japan and Fatima are, he used the phrase, essentially the same. Wow. So, th so, it, so these are monster events coming our way, you know. Um, Three of the girls were shown the great chastisement of fire that would come if, if, the operative word is if, if, you're, if humanity reverts to its evil ways after the grace of the great miracle. The girls were heard sighing, oh, don't let this happen. Don't let this come. May everyone go to confession first. The girls wept. Don't let this happen. Don't let this come. Forgive us. Don't let this happen. So, you know, for very young girls to have seen this, in the same way, um, you know, a uh, visionary of um, Francesco, literally, well, I forget, eight or nine years old, was literally shown 
shown hell as a little boy. Yeah. So where a lot of these these things as adults, we would think there'd be too much for little children. But it really made Francesco of Fatima a very, very serious boy spiritually at very, very young. Yes. So, That's important to know that our Blessed Mother, you know, she's filled with grace, yet she knows what's best for us and shows these children, you know, these visions of hell still, right? Or here yeah. are the, the four visionaries of of Garbandal, these nights of screams, right? But it's she knows it's for the best. Yeah, it's nothing, you know, it, it's pretty sobering for, you know, and you'll, you'll never forget it. So then on June 23rd, 62, Our Lady gave Jacinta and Mary Lowley the following message. So this was, this was three days after the last one. So it's kind of a continuum. And as Barry Hanratty said, you know, the tears coming down their face that, you know, this had a major impact on them. And the messages came out much slower. It wasn't like one big body of message. The Virgin told us that if the world continues the same, that and it has not changed at all, that few will see God. So few they are, it is causing the Virgin great sorrow. How unfortunate that the world does not change. The Virgin has told us that the chastisement is coming. As the world is not changing, the cup is filling up. How sorrowful is the Virgin. Now, remember, that was one of the first messages. The cup is filling up, and then the, the, uh, the cup is flowing over, which I think we got into last time. So here she is just a year, literally um, after, eleven, literally 11 months after, she's talking about the cup is filling up. Since the Virgin loves us so much, she suffers alone since she is so good. Everyone be good so that the Virgin will be happy. She has told us that those who are good should pray for those who are evil. Yes, we should pray to God for the world and for those who do not know him. Be good. Very good. That's, in essence, the entire message of Garabandal. It's about amendment of life. That's it. I think we hit that a little bit last time. And, and that's why, you know, I also highlight you know, um, your book and how you also had that feedback about your book gives hope, you know, and that's a great thing to have. So when we have this information from you, you compile all this and make your analysis that you get great hope after reading your book. You know, there are three cardinal virtues, faith, faith, hope, and charity, you know, and I'm originally from Rhode Island and, and, and hope is, is on the flag of Rhode Island. It's an anchor. Right. Yes. So it's a, it's a very significant thing. When you lose hope, you can get into never mind anxiety, stress, all the way to depression, and then it can go to despair. But it's without hope, it, it's actually very often hard to have love or any sort of charity or even faith. Exactly. You lose hope. These messages are so hopeful for the world; they're on a completely different dimension. Right, They're because extremely it, hopeful for you, all humanity. Yes, because Our Lady and Our Lord are are giving the game plan, and we can be prepared, which gives us hope. Whether rather than being caught by surprise and not knowing what to do. Right. And so, also, you know, recently we, you know, we just have, you know, the 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 tribute to life. And, um, you know, there's a talk about abortion through these kids, or was that really mentioned? Because, you know, if I'm putting the connection about Russia and abortion, if I remember right, Russia, what was it back in 1917, was the first country in the world to legalize abortion. I, I, I thought I heard that as the, uh, if that could be correct, but, you know, this might be the connection there too. You know, well, uh, 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 Russia was the first, you know, it talked about, you know, Russia would spread her errors throughout the world in Russia. I, I spent two years in Belarus and then previously had been two years in Poland. And frankly, you know, an OBGYN over there is just an abortionist wow. woman. Woman will, you know, I had several, many, many different translators over the over the years there. And a, a fair number of them were younger women. They would talk to you about an abortion like they were, you know, going out for a cup of coffee. Oh it was just a normal way of life over there. Abortion was no big deal whatsoever. But abort, to the best of my knowledge from my reading, I, I don't I never saw the word abortion being mentioned. 
there, but I'll tell you what it said. Conchita uh, spoke quite openly about the developments by which men in the near future would rebel against God on the day after Our Lady's last appearance at Garabandal. Conchita asked the author how someone can kill a child without killing the mother. The author spontaneously answered, now what gave you that idea? And so, and Conchita said, well, the Blessed Mother spoke about this and she let me know that this, this will happen with the overflowing of the chalice. The cup was filling up with the overflowing would be ubiquitous abortion. In the United States with Roe versus Wade, you know, and, and so abortion, a 12 year old girl, the Blessed Mother, I can't find out ever used the word abortion, but a child could die in its mother's womb. And she said, and Conchita said this tr trembling without being able to visualize what it really implied. Now, mind you, a 13 year old girl in a mountain village with the word abortion. I can tell you at 12 years old, even, yeah, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, exactly. You know, she said it disturbed her very much, but she felt ridiculous because she had not understood at all how this could happen. Blessed Virgin had not explained it to her. And up until that moment, nobody had been able to explain it to her at all. Right. So what, what it appears is that part of the, not appears, specifically the cup is now flowing over. And, a, and that is very much abortion on demand worldwide. Now, we yes. don't even know due to the, due to the, you know, the morning after pill and all sorts of chemical abortions now in on average college campus and you know no nobody knows how big abortion is any longer woman will just take it now as a precaution just in case right we're in the billion multiple billions exactly um so so let's go over the part of, of regarding uh russia and communism and then we'll, let's talk about that comet that's supposed to come in around october 13 of this year 2024 so because yeah. you know we're, we're we're talking about this you know fire in the sky or something uh you know it, it, you know astronomical or astrological or what whatever this great miracle may be but there's something touch you know connecting russia to all this we just talked about abortion and russia being the first uh country to legalize it back in i thought 1917 but it's supposed to you know overrun the great part of the free world here well, this is it. Russia suddenly, the, the phrase that was used, Russia will suddenly and unexpectedly overrun a great part of the free world. Now, we, we know, you know, we've got the European Union. We now have 30 mem me, uh, NATO uh, members. Finland has an 800 mile border with the Soviet Union. That's from where you're sitting to Chicago. Oh. I mean, so, you know, it, it, you know, Poland exposed in Poland, you know, historically just has had very bad geography between the Germans and the and the Russians rolling over it. But Mary Lowley was asked, since you are not allowed to tell me the exact year of the warning, perhaps you could tell me approximately when it will happen. Lowley responded, it will be at a time when the world will most need it. Now, what, what I find kind of interesting about that. A lot of people have had these events in their own mind uh, to happen very, very immediately once they begin to read them. We're not there yet with the data points, whether it's the Senate, the Pope to Moscow, Russia hasn't moved. But now with 90,000 troops coalescing with the NATO members, uh, and you've got 14 nations right now planning among the 30 NATO members they're now actively planning for war in, in their own parliaments, in their own negotiations internally with their own citizens. I saw the list the other day. They're actively right now planning for war with Russia. So when it says unexpectedly, frankly, it's on the news nearly every day now. So I'm, I'm not, I guess, maybe for the people who really aren't necessarily watching the news, it'll be very unexpected. But no matter what, it's going to be suddenly uh, uh, about five or six months ago during the um, the war in the Ukraine, I read just in a news article, which I put in the book, that um, a Russian general said, yeah, it would take us all of about six minutes to get into Poland. Oh, goodness. You know, I mean, look at the border. Right. 
you know. So Russia will suddenly ex unexpectedly overrun a, a great part of the free world is is Western in, in Europe. And, and you've got Eastern Europe. God does not want this to happen. And, and she said, holy mass can, um, the warning will come when you see that the holy mass cannot be celebrated freely anymore. Then it will be that the world will most need the intervention of God. This God, you know, a lament of mine as an adult, he's always the God of the 11th hour. He wants to see if you're going to trust. I mean, you know, things we've been doing for so long in our adult life. The Lord tends to bring you right to the edge to see if you're going to trust. And it's, and frankly, the history of a lot of the saints, that they tell the same sorts of stories. So we know that um, it's going to be when the world will most need it. So you, you, looking what's happening with Russia. Now, Fatima was specifically mentioned Russia and Garabandal mentioned Russia, which is quite fascinating. Yes. And the fact that when we read that quote from The Flame of Love about there's nothing like this happened to be will happen before. And so and, and she says it's the greatest miracle of all. And so if we put that in relation to the uh, great miracle or the um, miracle of the sun in Fatima, this is going to be something greater. That was just 70,000 people. I mean, that was a lot. It's not mass hysteria. So this is going to be greater than 70,000. Conchita specifically said this, the miracle would be the miracle would be much greater than what happened at Fatima. Yes. That was from her lips to the world's ears. That's incredible because again, uh, of the fact of Fatima with all those people, again, believers to non-believers saw it. And then okay. here it is about, well, what about this, um, if we can go on to this uh, supposed comment that's going to come around in October 13, 2024. And I, don't, I think that's like a couple of weeks before the ending of the synod. <laughs> Isn't that right? Well, you know, I don't know the exact date yet of, or I, I know the next, the universal component or the third year, which is, I said, the reason I decided really to do this, because the events are now much clearer in focus, if this material is true, which I believe it is. So, you know, you can see things, you can see the lights now in the tunnel, you know, and their time is moving at our thing. But there is supposed, the miracle will not delay in coming, Conchita said. But uh, there, was, although it will take time to come, it will not be late. God's time is always the appropriate time. On this, this, Conchita specifically said, she was asked, is it like a comet? She said, you know, 12, 13, I don't know what a comet is. Now, just even as a result of doing the book, I had to look at the difference between a comet, an asteroid, and a meteor. And so to help people out here for what I already did, a comet is basically a ball of ice and rock. And then uh, um, um, an asteroid is basically just rocks. And a meteor is something that's coming into our atmosphere, which is why you, you see them always, you, like you always see space, space capsules flaming as they come back because the heat will, a lot of them burn out. So I specifically said even on this asteroid, this comet that's coming, although Conchita said it is not a comet, but you know could be like a comet. Um, it's closest to the Earth, um, October thirteenth, two thousand twenty-four, and she said it will be. It begins with an A. Everybody has always tried to figure out what A is, and I put the three or four possibilities without saying which one it is, and let the reader decide. But the Chinese have found a comet in, in Chinese, say, Tshushinshan, T-S-U-C-H-I-N-S-H-A-N, Tshushinshan, if that's how you say it in Chinese. And it, they're calling it the Atlas C-2023, was found apparently in, in 2023. And that's when it will be closest to the Earth. So it begins with an A. So the Chinese are calling it Atlas, which is interesting. And then there's other speculation. It could be a rainbow, et cetera. So, but it should be recognized. Comets have an absolute way of being unpredictable. They fizzle out because they are a mass of ice. And by the time they, they do burn out and fizzle out. But on the other hand, um, I found this fascinating that it could be so big and so light. 
that the whole world will see it according to China. That and you know it's 44.3 million miles away, October 13th. So th these are massive, 44 million miles away. You can't even comprehend that. Right. You know. Here's what she said. She said the warning begins according to Conchita as a sighting in the sky, but it's not a comet, meteor, or or anything of a physical nature, since it will be supernatural and not be explained by science. It will be seen and felt. This is where the Blessed Mother said, you can't comprehend this. It's never been seen before. It's not a comet. It could be like a comet. It can be seen and felt. So what could these things be? I mean, up until Moses, when he left Egypt, the uh, a sea had never parted. Right. You know? So, you know, we, we tell about those stories, you know, thousands of years later. So what could this be? I think in the future, you know, we're going to be speaking about time before the warning and after the warning. There's more data specifically on the miracle specifics, 8.30 p.m., than, than Isaiah gave the world about the coming of Jesus. There, we, we know that, you know, uh, Jesus was prophesied through the prophets. But when you take Isaiah, you know, especially 50 through 58, a lot of the material is about Jesus. He will be called Emmanuel, you know, Bethlehem, et cetera. But this, the, you know, 8.30 p.m. on the Feast of a Young Eucharistic Martyr, um, March, April, May, June, there's a lot of very specific things here. And it's never been, I, in, in prophecy, I haven't seen anything as specific as this with such quantity and volume. Right. Will will not be explained by science. That's very, very key phrase. In other words, we, we, people can speculate all, all they want. I hear stuff all over the net. And, you know, Garabandal's kind of been a little hot lately, especially for the reasons about the Synod and, the, and a Pope going to Moscow. I get that. And it's the reason I decided to do it because of the clarity now of possibilities. But people are guessing all sorts of stuff. Is it true? Maybe. Are they using another person's prophecy or locutions to validate it and, and mix and match? Possible. But this is what it is all on its own. Yes. And so, you know, with this, um, um, with Kachita saying that it's uh, a sighting in the sky, but not a comet, meteor or anything, but then I just remember there was something where there's, you know, they see some sort of light in the sky. And that's, I guess, why people were wondering, well, could it be this comet, especially the one coming in October, you know, um, well, that's you know, coming the closest. And on right. the day of uh, Fatima, the, the miracle of, uh, you know, of um, the great miracle of the sun. So, right. you know, it can't help that people will start talking about, is, is, that the, is that what they're talking about? You know, a particular event. And so, you know, we did talk about in our, in our um, a show last time about those criteria about the great miracle that, you know, uh, you mentioned it already, the young, the feast of a young martyr. Um, I didn't know if you can give some of your views on that. Um, I mean, there's I know you have certain people that you can look up on the calendar, but um well, yeah, th this has been kind of a guessing game. You know, a lot of this started, you know, as the Jubilee of the year 2000 came about, everybody thought things would happen then. And, you know, the year of the Holy Spirit, the year of Jesus, God, the Father, and then the Jubilee. And, you know, there there are some, there are the same names being bandied about. Uh, and, and then I stumbled across one years ago that I haven't seen people write about. But we know there's St. Pancras. And if you, they're all on the net with some history. Um, you've got St. Hermenengeld, and there's a little bit of a couple of sentences on that. And then you have St. Stanislaus. Uh, but, you know, in, you know, how big could this definitive anthology be of, of young Eucharistic martyrs in the church, where we know the church was, you know, the Roman Empire fell in 454 officially. And the Christians were persecuted far after Constantine's edict because of the animus built up among these people against these people. So um, how many martyrs, you know, 
that could be called a martyr of the Eucharist. Nobody knows. Right. And well, but, there's, but there's one little girl who I've always been fascinated about, and she's the patron saint of first communicants. And, oh. um, and her name is Blessed Amelda Lambertini. She died at 13 years old on May 13th. Wow. Where she was nine years old and she wanted to receive the Eucharist. She went to her parish priest who denied her. She wasn't old enough for her confirmation to receive the Eucharist. And there's been different times of this in different ages of the church where the church allows children to re for their first, commu first communion. And so then she went to her bishop and the bishop denied her as well. So she was uh, during a church service. She was actually um, in church and she wasn't at the communion rail. She wasn't allowed to receive. And the Eucharist literally flew out of the priest's sub ciborium or whatever, whatever it was contained in it, you know, the M Middle Ages. And it landed on her tongue, and immediately after she died of of the uh, of ecstasy, exactly yeah. the same way Father Louis Andreu died after seeing the miracle. He died of pure joy. He died of a spiritual ecstasy as he was in the car. He said, "Today has been the happiest day of my life. Milagro, milagro, milagro!" And he simply died. And yes. Well, I, I'd like of, you to talk a little bit uh, on that. Too um, what uh, as far as the Eucharist, isn't this something that the girls received the Eucharist from Saint Michael the Archangel uh, in, initially in the beginning? Well, there were several times. As a matter of fact, um, there's a quote from Conchita where she was asked by Doctor Dominguez up in New York City, which I put the interview in the book. Uh, I thought it was just several, but apparently it was many more times that where they did receive the Eucharistic mystically from uh, the archangels. And um, th they asked where they got it. And there's the very, very famous picture where you see it. It's the yes. most famous pictures of all Garabandal, where it appears on her tongue. And these pictures have been circulating all over the Internet, all over the world for, you know, since the early 60s. Right. And that's before all this, you know, Photoshop imaging and stuff. So, um, you know, it's kind of hard to do. Um, but, but we're also told the, the, uh, the miracle would be Eucharistic and Marian. So yes. back to this mystery again, what could be Eucharistic and Marian? We know also from St. Faustina that there's a miracle where as Jesus is, is, is suspended on a cross, where, he, where the cross is over the world and where the wounds are of Jesus, rays of light go out to the world. And it's frankly the reason I put that picture on the cover of Thunder of Justice in 1993. Yes, which was a big worldwide bestseller. Um, yes, and then, um, but tell us about uh, th this Father Andrew, Andreu, I should say. Father Andreu was a young Jesuit priest. His brother was was um, uh, also a Jesuit priest by the name of Ramon, who then uh, had been very close to Jacinta's family, and he had posts all over the world later. Uh, Taiwan, and he actually ended up back in Southern California and reunited with Jacinta's family and was his spiritual director until he died in Southern California. But Father Andreu is a priest who is very, very close to the girls. And so if you really want to take a look at who has seen the miracle, we know for a fact Padre Pio saw it, a priest, before he died. He told a priest that he saw the miracle before he died. Um and then we have Father Andreu. Now, it's not clear. We know that uh, that even Conchita or the girls actually did see the miracle, but we know Padre Pio did, and we know Father Andreu. So here are two priests who are very, very central to the message of Garabandal, which we know it's about amendment of life, the priesthood, the sacredness of the Eucharist, and being in fidelity to, to the faith. Yes. Um so We're following. getting close to like five minutes uh, before we have to end the show. I want to make sure that people understand uh, the timeline as far as the warning and, and the chastisement. And so if I understand it right, the warning will happen after the chastisement has run its course, or is it the other way around? 
Um, it, that's, that's a question I don't really know how to answer, you know, because it, it, as I always say, people, it, 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 what is a great chastisement? If, if you were in a war, if you were in Gaza right now, it, whether no matter what country you're from, or had you been in Sarajevo or something during the Bosnian war, you would think you're in the chastisement. So I'm very, very loath to talk about, you know, um, an event specifically at a certain time, because because it's all a conditional thing. If you're in Kiev right now, which they started out with 44 million people, of which 44 percent in the Ukraine uh, were were actually considered themselves Russian. And so if you are I didn't I meant not uh, Kiev, but in Ukraine as a whole, if you're one of the 10 million people that are either dead wounded or in refugee status you'd think it's a chastisement mm. so i i look at this very very global not so much as an insular view but from a global picture and maybe it's the reason i've, I've reported on so many apparitions because the blessed mother is the queen of heaven and earth she's the mother of the son she's the daughter of the father and she's the spouse of the holy spirit and she is the immaculate conception so this is a global phenomenon that, you know, I'm a little loath to say this happens then, this happens next time. But we, we're told that there is some sort of schism that comes after a synod. So, um, you know, here we you say we've got five minutes, so we've probably only touched a portion of what we would have liked to have done. But this is very, very dense material. So again, this for me personally, and, and maybe other people will see it different. This is like three acts in the same play. You're in the same seat, but each each act is separate and distinct. There are separate and distinct things that happen within that. And there is a warning, there is a miracle, and there is a permanent sign. And the warning precedes that. And we know within 365 days after the warning is a great miracle. Yes. And so I think also some some people would say would would just um, have under conjecture saying, well, if it's a three part series, wouldn't like the first part, the warning be like the bad news. And then the 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 great miracle would be the good news. And the permanent sign is like to keep to keep people in that mindset of something good, like you can change on 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 whether it's good news or bad news. So it's like the Lord is giving us a chance. I'm just leaving this here for you as a permanent sign to think of the good things, why you should change and change permanently. And you know, then you know, wondering if that, if people still don't follow, then then they can get the chastisement. You see what I mean? The cup is flowing over. It, 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 she used the, the word if, so there's this conditional thing. But personally, for me, I'm not seeing an amendment of life. If you mm -hmm. want to take a look at, um, at, at the scriptures, before there is uh, restoration, any time in the scripture uh, for a nation for restoration, there has to be repentance. I'm not seeing that. Yes. Well, I, I know also here, just in some of the, your, your, in your book, how it's, it says how a major event in the church where there will be a reunification of Christians. And as we in the flame of love, we pray that unity prayer. I mean, that's just not for us who follow as devotees, but it's really for the whole world, whether you're Christian or not. But this talks about the use of the word reunification. So well, this, that means something split. That's right. By very, very definition to be reunited, it was a one time one in the Catholic church, whether or not you want to look at the Eastern right with the Western right, uh, would be one uh, nearly a thousand years ago. And then over 500 years ago, about 507 now, was actually the Protestant Reformation. So could you imagine that the uh, reunification of, of these churches coming under the umbrella of Catholicism? Right. And so that's the thing. That's why we in the flame of love, you know, pray the unity prayer. But also we uh, ask, invoke the Blessed Mother's help. And, you know, we're, um, I didn't know if you want to have any last parting words. Uh, we have like 30 seconds left before we have to get off. Um, Ted? Uh, that'd be <laughs> tough for me. Yeah. The word is hope. A woman read the book for me as a proofreader. 
And she said I was, you know, borderline anxiety about the state of the church and the culture. And she said, after reading this material on Garabandal, I have great hope that God has a plan. That's what this is about. This is about God's love to a very broken world. Well, I highly recommend your book. I thank you for joining me again on part two on Garabandal and your book. Um, I want to have you back even again some more because there's still um, more things to cover. Um, and uh, I just recommend everybody to go buy that book or go on their website, sign.org, and get their magazine and book there and that Flame of Love uh, issue. So God bless you, Ted, uh, and say hi to Maureen for me. And I thank all the uh, listeners and viewers out there who can watch us on YouTube and Facebook and Vimeo. Um, and uh, of course, listen on Radio Maria on the Flame of Love show. Thank you again, Ted, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. God bless you.